Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I'm a dental surgeon and also the course director for a series of online lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic online program. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 9, The Prosthetic Phase, Part 1. So the strategy behind Lecture 9 is basically to break Lecture 9 down into a series of subparts, and the purpose of this is basically to provide a comprehensive Lecture 9 on the prosthetic phase, but also not have it so that these YouTube lectures are very, very long, and you end up with a two or three hour uh, long YouTube uh, video to watch. So, uh, and the purpose of this also is that if you have to go back, you can go back to the specific part that you want to revisit as opposed to having to go through the whole video all over again. So, yeah, what we're going to do is basically break this down into uh, what appears to be three parts. And the agenda is basically to have part one talking about prosthetic pearls, part two to talk about impression techniques, and part three to talk about different types of restorations that can be done. And we'll supplement this with a number of case presentations, which are some of which are already on YouTube and some which we will post later on. So to further break uh, part one down, or, or the section on prosthetic pearls, we're going to talk about 10 things here. So we'll talk about loading protocols, uh, number two, abutment material choice, number three, abutment designs, uh, number four, uh, restoring multi-rooted teeth with single implants, some considerations for that. Uh, number five, uh, the choices of cement that can be used in cemented uh, prostheses. Uh, number six, screw-retained versus cement-retained prostheses. Uh, number seven, implant protective occlusion. Number eight, progressive loading. Number nine, pontic designs. And finally, number 10, some of the seven principles that we borrowed from architecture that we we're going to try to apply to uh, prostheses. And these were published in an article in 2004 by uh, Dr. Lee Sun Bok from South Korea. So part two, we're going to talk about different types of impression techniques. So for part two, we're going to talk about things like the closed tray technique, the open tray technique, use of hex or non-hex um, impression copings, uh, indexing, uh, different forms of verification jigs, and finally, uh, different types of models and how they get porn up. And then uh, finally, in part three, we're going to talk about different types of prostheses that can be offered uh, to our patients. So from the the, uh, the bread and butter single crown that we do for patients to fix partial dentures or bridges, to metal hybrid dentures, to implant supported complete porcelain dentures, to finally implant supported partial dentures for patients. So before we start the prosthetic uh, pearls or part one of this lecture nine prosthetic phase, uh, let's go back to a couple of the other lectures that we had previously just to sort of follow up on cases uh, i'd sort of put down a couple of cases were in progress so i thought maybe if you, you know if those who are interested uh, perhaps might be interested in seeing the uh, the the outcome of these cases so in lecture seven we talked about post-surgical follow-up so we had that patient um, who had the failed maxillary anterior bridge and in this case uh, she had basically had a bit of a mutilated dentition in the sense that uh, she had lost some teeth uh, prematurely and uh, more or less uh, you can see this uh, prosthesis on the picture on the left, the midline had been shifted and she wasn't very happy with it. The, uh, the cosmetic outcome wasn't really what she had uh, sought out. So in the picture on the right, you can see what we basically done. We were basically able to take that uh, upper left cuspid that had moved mesially as a result of premature tooth loss and basically accept that as our lateral incisor, or at least mask it to look like a lateral incisor using a all ceramic crown and then basically give her a prosthesis uh, supported by uh, four implants and in this particular case you can see that we were able to basically using the the golden proportions uh, give this patient uh, a, a result that looked much more cosmetically uh, pleasing for her uh, and also uh, corrected that midline discrepancy. In the next photograph or the next slide which you'll see is the, the case retracted so once again the original case on the left and the uh, final outcome uh, 
on the right and in the next picture you'll see basically an occlusal shot of that uh, correction of that midline uh, for that patient and she was very happy and then in lecture eight we talked about a few things uh, we talked about the h incision for patients uh, versus using a tissue punch or a circular incision and the main reason we had described this was different ways of sort of accessing your your patient or your implant um, after placement and the main major difference of the H incision versus a circular incision or use of a tissue punch is your your a, a you're keeping a lot of keratinized tissue in the area and you're also basically beefing up the soft tissue biotype by sort of beefing up the amount of of uh, of uh, of, uh, of mucosal tissue uh, or sorry uh, the connective tissue that uh, sort of uh, sits in and around the implant so to show you a photograph of the patient with that H incision on the left and sort of what the case looked like a few months down the road as I would mentioned to you uh, when you do cement that uh, tooth or that whether it be screw retained or cemented uh, crown uh, it basically pushes up against those weak sort of like uh, 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 H incision lines and f sort of uh, puffs out the tissue and you end up getting a very very nice emergence profile for the patient so here's a picture of that right there and in lecture 8 we also talked about the circular incision we described this case of this lady who had basically come in seeking a more aesthetic result and so we did a bunch of things for her you'll see the the case on the left originally and the final case on the right so she was very pleased with the aesthetic outcome as well and you can see fully retracted the patient once again on the left in the, compared to the case on the right the final case we were able to level that occlusal plane out in order to address some of the deep bite aspects uh, this was also the case with a lady who had the uh, impacted eye tooth in which we had to basically go to the posterior more tooth to uh, gain a, a posterior abutment uh, for this implant supported um, uh, prosthesis for this patient so she was very happy so let's move towards prosthetic pearls and I can't really comment about a lecture on prosthetic pearls without obviously paying a homage to uh, my mentor uh, in dentistry the picture on the right is Dr. Michelin Banville who is a retired major from the Canadian Forces Dental Services I learned uh, much from this lady in the uh, six years in which I was uh, fortunate enough to work alongside with her and uh, I always used to joke around with her and say that for, for me the, the, the goal or the long term goal from a clinician perspective would be to basically be able to uh, get to the bar of the standard at which she uh, performed and I'm pretty sure that I was able to get to the bar in terms of being able to have clinical outcomes that were as, uh, as uh, aesthetic and functional as what she had been able to provide for her patients in her career. However, I always used to joke around with her and say that she always kept the bar moving higher and higher. So it sort of became a bit of a, a, frustrating, uh, a frustrating adventure uh, from my perspective. So let's just start off with lecture part one, prosthetic pearls. We're going to talk about the first thing is uh, think about, thing about loading protocols. So in terms of loading protocols, we have to go to, to uh, a couple of sort of consensus papers that sort of had come out. And more or less, they talk about loading protocols for implant-supported prostheses based on primary stability. And this is from the 2008 and 2013 ITI consensus conferences uh, on loading protocols for patients. And more or less what they stated was, if it was the case that you were able to get 35 to 50 Newton centimeters of primary stability, and remember that, uh, that Newton centimeters or torque is a rotational component. It doesn't necessarily talk about sort of the lateral stability. I've seen implants in my own practice where we were able to get excellent primary stability from a rotational uh, stability perspective. However, when you sort of push on these lateral, you'll notice that there's very, very le weak lateral stability. In many cases, this is for patients where we'll be extracting teeth and doing immediate placement of implants. So what they're stating in this pa these papers here, if it was the case that you were able to get 35 to 50 Newton centimeters of uh, good primary stability, and we're assuming that these are not immediate placement of implant cases where there's weak lateral stability, that you can immediately load these prostheses. And immediate loading is anything from the day of the surgery up until one week. They also advocate that anytime you're going to be getting 25 to 30 Newton centimeters of primary stability for a patient, you want to consider delayed loading. So this is going to be anywhere from one week to the two-month mark, or as we, we traditionally talk in orthopedics, about the six weeks uh, for getting that uh, that uh, stability or of that heal or sorry that initial healing of that bone and then lastly they talk about 10 to newton 20 newton centimeters of rotational primary stability in which in this case they talk about things like conventional loading which is two months and beyond and by beyond this can be anywhere from uh, the classical six month to beyond six month in patients who are either immunocompromised uh, patients suffer from diabetes uh, older patients or any patient who is not uh, appear to be healing uh, as per plan
So if you take a look at this graph over here, basically we're talking about primary stability being old bone and secondary stability being the formation of new bone. And so uh, many times when we place implants, we'll find that when we first place them, there's excellent primary stability uh, with them. And uh, it's a few weeks down the road. And usually they say about 21 days is when the implant is sort of most susceptible to having the weakest sort of stability. And this is basically the portion where that old bone is sort of remodeling and the new bone is forming. So we say that in between these two stages is when the implant is most as at risk. And so the 21 day mark is really when you want to basically make sure that uh, that there's not going to be sort of any excessive forces uh, being placed uh, upon these implants. So even though many times we can be fooled that, you know, we put a bunch of implants in, they have excellent primary stability, and the patient comes back, and we, sorry, we immediately load them with the prosthesis, and they happen to be a heavy bruxer or have some sort of unrealistic expectations with respect to the actual function, you know, capabilities of their implant-supported prosthesis, we find that... <clears throat> Uh, we ask ourselves well, what, what happened in this sort of a case and this this the graph will sort of explain uh, sort of what what happened uh, some implant companies and manufacturers have claims about increases in bone healing due to the implant design and that may be you know that may be true to a certain extent or it may be more true due to the cases that they were used in I can tell you from my own clinical experience uh, going back to lecture one where we talked about the principle of dynamic reciprocity it really depends on the patient that you have so it's not just how the implant acts on the body but how the body acts upon the implant so irrespective of implant design if you have a patient who's in poor health patient who is in poor compliance a situation which is not ideal to uh, this sort of a situation or the situations in which some sort of an implant design study was conducted it's not going to work so just a just a heads up in that sort of regard so implant design can improve upon the initial stability of the dental implant, and we covered this in lecture one, and this was with respect to different types of thread pitch, the internal condensation effects, the wedging effects, and a couple of uh, the other uh, other principles that we described uh, in lecture one. I'll refer you back to lecture one if you've uh, forgotten some of those points. And then finally, lastly, we'll talk about Initial fixation. There's three types of initial fixation. So as you know, we have bone, and bone usually has a cortex, and then there's some sort of uh, middle or cancellous section to it. And usually bone will also, you know, being a one piece of bone, will also have an inside component to it too as well. And this internal aspect will also have a cortex to it. So we talk about three types of initial fixation. So there's CCF, which is crestal cortical fixation, uh, MCF, which is middle cancellous fixation, and finally ICF, which is the interior cortical fixation. So many times you'll hear of people talking about bicortical fixation of an implant, and that's basically where you're going from one to three, uh, obviously going through two. And this is sort of some people have stated is the uh, sort of the, uh, the superior uh, type of fixation that you can provide for a dental implant. So we then go to abutment material choice, and uh, more or less the gold standard for uh, abutment material uh, is some form of a metal. Uh, there are different types of non-metal uh, abutments that have been proposed as time has gone along as well. So in terms of metal, we usually will advocate some sort of a type 4 uh, dental alloy. And just like we use in most fixed partial dentures, in a single crown, we'd use, say, perhaps a type 2 soft uh, metal alloy or a type 3 alloy. In some sort of a fixed prosthesis or like a bridge, you're going to want to use a type 4 dental alloy for the stiffness. So you can use gold, you can use titanium, uh, there's all the other types of materials that are out there, uh, my recommendation more or less is to liaise or communicate with a laboratory that you'll be working with and basically ask them what the best clinical results they've been getting with the materials that they uh, use are, uh, as opposed to sort of dictating uh, what you think is going to work best. Uh, in, in dentistry, you know, I've been practicing myself for almost 15 years at, at this point in time, and I've been very humbled by uh, there being the a variety of different tips, tricks, and techniques that are out there. And a, a mentor of mine once told me, it's not necessarily a right or wrong technique. It's the technique or the material that works best in your hands. So not in someone else's hands, not in you know the guy who's the best or the guy who's the worst hands. It's it's a matter of what works best in your hands or what, what gives you the best clinical results. So um, if metal works well with you or works well with your lab, go with that. Uh, there's also many non-medical options that are out there. Uh, people talk about monolithic uh, monolithic ceramics, things like zirconia. Uh, there was in the old days of the Procera aluminous oxide uh, base copings. So many of these are excellent. They've got excellent strength or static strength. I'm not quite sure from a long-term perspective what the long-term studies on these materials uh, demonstrate. You know, cycles of loading, unloading, cycles of heating, cooling, uh, cycles of being in, in a in a in the mouth bathed in saliva with the different types of uh, ions around them 
Uh, so uh, with other materials, galvanic cell reactions and things that can occur, uh, the list goes on. So I'm not really quite sure uh, what the what the studies would basically indicate as being the best material, whether it be metal or non-metal. So once again, I would advocate go to your lab, communicate with your lab, develop a solid relationship uh, with your lab techs. I have a uh, I have a tremendous relationship with my own lab tech. Uh, I mean, uh, I sometimes I shouldn't say, I'll quote a colleague of mine who's a prosthodontist, a lecturer I once attended, and he basically said that his lab tech is half of his clinical outcome. So uh, if the outcome is good, he gives half the credit to his lab tech. And if the outcome doesn't look good, then you know half of the fault goes to the lab as well. So um, communication with your lab is uh, definitely something which we would advocate as being a, a a positive thing in terms of being able to uh, plan and achieve a, an excellent result for your patient. So in terms of clinical pearls, we'll move next to abutment design. In terms of abutment design, it really depends upon the implant system uh, which you are using. So uh, some we talked in lecture one about things like platform switching, we talk about index versus non-indexed uh, abutments, uh, different types of contour for gingival health or oral hygiene. Um, I'm going to basically leave this once again as one of those things for you to design uh, with your lab and in conjunction with uh, the sort of outcome that you're seeking for the patient, uh, sort of marrying all this information up with the uh, initial lectures uh, in lecture one, lecture two that we had uh, we had talked about um, different implant systems and treatment planning from an aesthetic perspective. So then we're going to talk about screw retained versus cemented. So I will tell you my bias. My bias is towards going for screw retained prostheses. And the main reason for this, uh, as we see here as number one, is its retrievability. There's no damage that's required to recover uh, the screw retained implant crown. And sort of as time has gone along, and with things like peri-implant diseases, peri-implant mucositis, peri-implantitis, um, other types of emergencies that we talk, covered in the in the uh, implant complications uh, lecture. Uh, having a screw retained crown just makes life so much easier uh, with respect to getting that crown off. Uh, there's other things about accessibility uh, of the of the of the crown or underneath the crown, the aesthetics. So if you take a look at the picture here on the bottom, obviously a hole going right through the occlusal surface of the tooth is not going to work for some people. They you know they paid lots of money. They want to see something that looks like a tooth. Uh, in many times it comes down to angulation of the actual implant so if you have an implant in the maxillary anterior and the screw is going to be coming on the buccal aspect of the incisal edge and you have to cover this up uh, there are excellent uh, means of masking uh, the the metal and the porcelain and getting a nicer fiber optic effect with some of the newer composite resins that are available out there however many times this is difficult for us to achieve and so you have no choice but to go with a a cemented uh, restoration there's also the options of cost and in some labs a UCLA abutment or some sort of a screw retained crown is going to be much more expensive than using some sort of a uh, prefabricated abutment, uh, either uh, using it the way it is or adapting this, uh, customizing it uh, with a burr and taking a conventional impression and just conventional crown and bridge technique for cementation of that crown. Uh, cost can be reduced by using this sort of a method. There's also issues with different types of cement some people state that if you have you know overexpression of cement depending upon where the margin of that implant crown is that this can end up causing uh, chronic inflammatory uh, reactions which can end up causing things like peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis and other issues of, like bone loss around uh, for the patient and then lastly there's things about passive fit uh, you, it's a lot easier to get a passive fit with a cemented crown as compared to with a screw retained crown uh, but this can be overcome uh, with experience and and skill so this graph here basically uh, or not graphs, sorry, this, this diagram here basically uh, indicates very nicely uh, the sort of differences of uses of screw retained implant crowns versus uses for cement retained implant crowns. So let's read the one on the left. So basically the need for the crown to be retrievable, you want to go with screw retained. Uh, if you have limited occlusal height, so less than four millimeters, um, it's easier to use a screw retained crown versus going with a cemented crown. Uh, and a lot of this just has to do once again with conventional crown and bridge in terms of the amount of vertical height that you need to cement a crown. Uh, it need for healthy tissue. If you need healthy tissue, it's easier to do this with a screw retained crown. Uh, the implant has to be in an ideal position. If it's not, uh, for example, we discussed the aspect of the anterior and uh, sort of the uh, screw access hole going out the buckle, that's not going to work. Uh, the passive situation, so obviously it's easier to get a passive situation with a cemented crown than it is a screw retained crown. Uh, an occlusal table with limited forces uh, in the sense that 
uh, in the sense that you don't want there to be uh, any sort of like heavy forces uh, on the implant. We know that implants like occlusal forces or vertical forces. Uh, they don't like horizontal forces. If the patient uh, is not a power chewer, uh, a screw retained crown gives you a little bit less flexibility than a cemented crown. And if they are a power chewer, you're going to still have that sort of break in the sense of that cement phase between the crown and the actual implant. And if it's the case that they end up causing problems, uh, that crown will pop off as opposed to the whole uh, implant getting that classic uh, sort of... Uh, uh, the crescent shape in, in the coronal aspect from uh, the patient basically orthodontically trying to move that implant out of the mouth. Uh, fee is not a factor. As I mentioned, sometimes a cemented crown using a stock abutment can be cheaper. Uh, and then lastly, we talk about aesthetics may be compromised uh, with a uh, screw retained crown. And uh, the other nice thing about a screw retained crown is that there's no cement to deal with, which in turn can lead to a be better uh, tissue response uh, for the patient. So sometimes you have no choice, as we talked about, basically there being uh, the position of the implant, uh, cost being a factor, and, and the lack of sort of 5 millimeter uh, abutment height. So continuing along with our cl uh, clinical pearls here, we're going to talk about basically restoring multi-rooted teeth uh, with single implants. And this isn't a super complicated point, but it's a small pearl uh, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that, um, Many times with implant dentistry, people think, okay, wow, these implants are awesome. They're so more solid than Rock of Gibraltar. Let's uh, put in one implant in the upper cuspid position and another implant in the posterior second molar position, and we'll basically, uh, we'll basically have uh, a bridge sort of connecting these things. And it's something which we refer to in the world of prosthetic, uh, prosthetic dentistry uh, when we talk about bridges, something called Ante's Law. And more or less, uh, the, the Ante's Law, as you know, you can't violate a certain percentage of root surface uh, for a span of a bridge as compared to um, what the patient would, would naturally have. So we need to basically consider Ante's Law or basically consider uh, over-engineering. I would advocate over-engineering our implant uh, solutions as compared to under engineering there's also the aspect of the soft tissue envelope that sort of goes around multi-rooted teeth many times remember that if you're going into a maxillary molar region there's three roots and many times the position of the of the implant is going to be sort of right in that trifurcation area and so you need to take into consideration the soft tissue envelope that's going to sort of heal around this and what the emergence profile is going to look like for for the tooth and the only reason we sort of mention this is because many times when patients do come back after having a molar taken out and having an implant placed in they'll state that they find that there's a lot of food uh, that can potentially get stuck in and around the actual implant crown and the solution for this is more or less uh, ensuring that when you're communicating with your lab your lab provides you with the crown that's going to basically uh, contour right up to uh, the uh, the um, implant fixture and as we talk about in some of the restorative uh, some of the some of the cases that we've presented in this lecture series you'll see how tissue goes white when i insert a lot of uh, crowns in and the basic purpose of this is to make sure that there's there's a intimate uh, sort of <clears throat> intimate sort of uh, uh, emergence profile, or, sorry, intimate contact between the prosthetic and the soft tissue so that things aren't getting stuck inside there and you're getting that proper soft tissue envelope. We're going to next talk about cement choices. So I already told you my bias. My bias is towards not having uh, cemented crowns, but and, and as we've indicated, many times you have no choice. So in terms of cement, um, many times people talk about using things like temporary cement uh, in order to have retrievability of uh, of these crowns. Uh, so we view, we use the all different types of uh, cements for patients. Sometimes we'll use tempon. Sometimes we'll use dical, which is a calcium uh, calcium hydroxide. A based uh, uh, basically it's a it's a liner as compared to a cement but you can use this as a temp cement as well and it also doesn't have eugenol inside it uh, we've also used GI looting cement so just things like uh, the product by 3M called Ketac and I realize this is not a, a temporary cement this is a permanent cement however uh, many times you'll find patients who will come in who've had an implant crown cemented with a temporary cement and more or less they'll complain that this thing keeps falling off uh, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that these cements have a a, a weaker bond strength to them as a, as a result of you want them to be uh, as you want them to be uh, retrievable uh, just a corollary to the story is my my mentor when I was working with her she had a patient who uh, who they weren't quite sure if the patient would require endo on a particular tooth uh, after having a crown prep and they already had the crown made and they cemented the the, the permanent crown uh, with a temporary cement 
And more or less, when it came down to deciding, okay, everything was fine for this tooth, from an endodontic perspective, uh, this tooth basically declared that it was going to be vital and not re require endodontic treatment. So they decided, okay, we're going to take this crown off, this crown that had been cemented with temporary cement, and cement it with a, uh, a more definitive cement, so something like a GI looting cement or a zinc phosphate cement. And more or less, uh, over, uh, they couldn't get it off. Uh, the temporary cement just would not allow this crown to come off. And every year she would have this patient come back and try to take this crown off. And this process went on for around 20 years where this crown, which they were expecting, had, which had been cemented with the temporary cement, uh, would come off very easily, wouldn't, wouldn't come off. Uh, just so just you know so just to let you know that sometimes temp cements can work uh, a little bit stronger than we expect and sometimes they don't uh, also mixing the cement with a water soluble lubricant will so it can also help, sort of help you reduce some of the uh, the uh, bond strength uh, uh, properties of a temporary cement. And lastly, we talk about depending upon the retention resistance factors in traditional crown and bridge, which talks about things like the amount of taper that there is for the actual abutment, the abutment length, and the abutment roughness. So a longer abutment length, a rougher abutment, and obviously uh, more parallel walls is going to give you more innate retention even without any cement. So uh, you may want to consider either you know starting off with using some water soluble lubricant with a temporary cement as compared to running into a scenario like my like my colleague where you, they use a temporary cement they could never get the crown off so closing the orifice so the question with a screw retained crown sort of becomes what are you supposed to do with this actual orifice so how do you get rid of that black orifice and how do you ensure that there's going to be no no leakage there so what i advocate in most of these cases is to basically etch the here using the, the standard uh, phosphoric acid etch that we use for our composite resin techniques uh, there's the option of basically putting either cotton or teflon or some people use gutta perca some people use uh, impression material some people use wax uh, my personal bias i like using something like teflon so polytetrafluoroethylene uh, and the main reason for this is it's not going to uh, basically uh, rot inside the uh, inside the chamber uh, if it was the case that you do get some leakage so those of you who have placed a few implants now you'll notice that sometimes when you drill those composite plugs off and you take those cotton pellets or some of the other items that are inside out they have got a weird sort of like stink to them and this doesn't occur with things like teflon so finally after we've etched we've uh, irrigated uh, the excess etchant off we dried things off prior to putting the teflon sorry uh, put our teflon inside uh, prior to putting any composite resin or acrylic or flowable composite resin in there i usually like taking uh, some bond as well some bonding resin and just sort of like putting that in and around there once again just to sort of help make sure that we have a excellent uh, seal here and the main purpose here is we don't want any leakage because leakage can be a problem at the uh, level of the implant abutment interface especially if there's micro movement uh, in this area and there will be some further research studies in this area uh, conducted to uh, basically hypothesize that this may be something which is related to the incidences of peri-implant uh, diseases. Implant protective occlusion. So what do we know about this, Pearl? Implants like vertical loading. Implants do not tolerate lateral forces. So basically you want to replicate large cases where centric relation is basically centric occlusion. And you want to restore patients to a balanced occlusion or a cuspid protected occlusion or group function with the appropriate anterior guidance. So there's there's 10 things we sort of talk about when we talk about implant protective occlusions. We talk about the elimination of premature contact. Uh, remember that there is no, is no sort of, uh, there is no, uh, no, no uh, a shock absorber uh, a property to an implant. So unlike your teeth, where people can sort of compress down on the periodontal ligament and you know basically get their teeth to come together a lot more, implants, they don't like this. So you don't want premature contracts. So when patients are biting down, you want them to bite down hard, especially if they have natural teeth, and make sure that everything is sort of is touching appropriately. You also want to ensure that the timing of occlusal contacts is appropriate. Number three, the surface area over which the occlusal forces are applied are even so obviously you want the force over a larger area is, is is less less pressure for that particular area you also want to consider the implant angle to the occlusal load so many times implants are put in to the bone uh, at an angle at which the bone was basically there and this basically will sort of handcuff you from an occlusion perspective so know that if an implant is angled uh, you want to ensure that the sort of the, the vector of forces that are acting on that implant are not going to be uh, are not going to be problematic 
Cuspal inclination is also something to consider uh, with implant protective occlusion. So you want to make ensure that you know, the, the cuspal inclination is not causing non-working interferences that may end up putting more lateral forces uh, on the particular uh, implant case. Cantilevers are also an issue. Uh, many times with conventional crown and bridge, we'll say, you know, restore a, a bridge with three teeth and have like one tooth cantilevering. So you can have cantilevers with implants too, but also recognize the force moments that are going to sort of occur in these cases. And just like in physics anywhere else, this is the same physics that's going to apply uh, for dental implants. Number seven, uh, the implant uh, crown contour. Uh, so obviously the wider the implant, the more surface area, uh, sorry, the wider the implant crown, the more surface area is going to be uh, for occlusion as compared to just sort of putting a smaller uh, crown uh, surface for the, for the patient. Uh, lastly, we talk about things like crown height. Some people I've heard actually restoring uh, teeth uh, outside of occlusion, sort of like half a million out of occlusion, so there is no occlusion. I, I wouldn't necessarily advocate this for uh, all cases, but in occasion, patients who are perhaps like a Bruxer or un, unreliable, you may want to consider something like this. Uh, occlusal contact position, and finally, uh, the occlusal material that is used. And in this sense, we're talking about uh, using something like, say, metal, as compared to having a uh, porcelain occlusal for the patient. So the next pro we're going to talk about is something like uh, progressive loading. So going back to previous lecture where we basically talked about stress as being a force divided by area so if you can increase the, you can reduce stress by basically uh, decreasing the force or controlling the bite force for the patient which in some cases is, is difficult but the one thing you can control is increasing the area uh, or the platform uh, of the implant which can basically uh, reduce the amount of stress that's going uh, into the bone and we go back to our lecture uh, lecture uh, two, where we talked about treatment plan, we talked about Wolf's Law. So bone, uh, so, sorry, this was lecture three in terms of bone metabolism uh, lecture. Uh, bone in a healthy person or animal will adapt to the loads under which it is placed. And if loading on a particular bone increases, the bone will remodel itself over time to become stronger to resist that sort of loading. However, there is a, a limit to how much force can be applied before the, the bone basically says, okay, that's it, we've had enough, well, we quit. So the next principle, or sorry, the next pearl we're going to talk about is prosthesis design or pontic design. So in terms of prosthesis design, a colleague of mine once once said in a lecture, don't give your patient a lunchbox prosthetic. So uh, things like modified ridge lap pontics, hygienic pontics, and saddle pontics uh, are different types of pontics or designs we give uh, patients for implant supported prosthesis. What you don't want is you don't want to give them a prosthesis where they're going to be basically building up food. And by food, I don't mean like, you know, half a sandwich, but I mean like you know, subtle amounts of food around the implant that are difficult to clean uh, such that this patient ends up with peri-implant diseases like peri-implant mucositis or worst case scenario, peri-implantitis. So we talk about seven principles of universal design, and these were developed in 1997 uh, by a working group of architects, which, uh, pro which product designers, engineers, and environmental design research led by the late Ronald Mace in the North Carolina State University. And the purpose of the principles was basically to guide the design of environments, products, and communications according uh, to the Center for Universal Design in NCSU, the principles can basically be applied to evaluate existing designs, guide the design process, and educate both designers and consumers about the characteristics of more usable products and environments. So basically, how not to give your patient a lunchbox prosthetic, how to give them something that's going to be useful, and give them something that's not going to cause problems. So uh, what is the best universal design? There was a paper by Dr. Lee Sung Bok in uh, 2004 basically incorporating uh, these seven principles. And these seven principles are uh, aqua, aquability in use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive, perceptible information, uh, a tolerance for error, low physical effort, and easy, easy oral hygiene maintenance. So talking about principle one, equability in use, the design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. And basically the guidelines here is to provide the same means for all users, so identical wherever possible, equivalent when not, avoid segregating or stigmatizing any users, provisions for privacy, security, and safety should be equally available to all users, and make the design appealing to all users. So basically what this is saying here is this can't be like the Michael Jordan three-pointer that only Michael Jordan can hit. Yeah, it's, it may be a great design, but if only like the, the, the only a small set of clinicians can use this, this is not uh, necessarily equitable, equitable uh, in use. Principle number two, there has to be flexibility in use. So 
many times, you know, some patients are six feet tall, some patients are four feet tall. Uh, some patients uh, are, uh, are uh, 100, 100 pounds, some patients are 200 pounds, some patients eat lettuce, some patients only eat, only eat meat. So there has to be flexibility to, the, to accommodate a wide range of individual, individuals, preferences and abilities. So there has to be some form of uh, uh, providing a choice for in methods of use, accommodating right or left-handed access and use, facilitate the user's accuracy and precision, and also provide adaptability to the user's pace. Uh, principle number three, it has to be simple and intuitive. So not like my my box of Panavia 21 cement that I have uh, in my fridge, where every time I use it, I got to go read the instruction book because I have to say, okay, was well, this part A and part B? Uh, do you, you know, do you do three Hail Marys and um, you know, uh, so how many how many other prayers you read before you use this material? That is not simple. That is not intuitive. So the use of design is easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. So basically, eliminate unnecessary complexity if possible. Be consistent with user expectations and intuition. Accommodate a wide range of literacy and language skills. And finally, arrange information consistent with its importance and provide effective prompting and feedback during and after task completion. Principle number four, perceptible information. So the design communicates necessary information effectively to the user regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. So using different modes, so pictorial, verbal, tactile for redundant presentation of essential information, providing adequate contrast between essential information and its surroundings, maximizing the legibility of essential information, uh, differentiating elements in ways that can be described, make it easy to give instructions or directions, and basically providing compatibility with a variety of techniques or devices used by people with sensory limitations. And in this sense, more or less, that there's a, a means by which it's, it's not just yourself working with some sort of a prosthesis or some sort of a design, but there being adequate feedback coming back to you with respect to if this is actually working or not. Perceptible uh, principle number five, a tolerance for error. So the design minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. And in this respect, we talked about passive fit with screw retained versus cemented uh, prostheses. So the arranging elements to minimize hard hazards and errors, most used elements, most accessible, hazardous elements, eliminated, isolated, or shielded, providing warnings of hazards and errors, provides fail-safe features and discourages un unconscious actions and tasks that require vigilance. So more or less, you're asking for technique tips and tricks and techniques that are going to give you a little bit of forgiveness if it's the case that you're, you're not doing things as per guidelines. Uh, principle number six, a low physical effort. So basically, design can be used if efficiently and comfortably with a minimum of fatigue. So as dentists, you know, we work, you know, long days, we work for long careers, and we don't want to be using prostheses or designs that are going to basically uh, shorten the, the uh, our career, our career length and make us susceptible to things like cumulative trauma disorders and stuff like that. So the guidelines here are allowing the user to maintain a neutral body position using reasonable operating forces, minimizing repetitive actions, and minimizing sustained physical activity. And then lastly, principle seven, the size and space for approach and use in the sense that the appropriate size and space is provided for approach, reach, manipulation, and use regardless of user's body size, posture, or mobility. Uh, so basically the guidelines here are providing a clear line of sight to important elements for any seated or standing user, making reach to all components comfortable from any seated or standing user, and accommodating variations in hand grip and size, and providing adequate space for the use of assistive devices or, or personal assistance. So the take-home point here of this whole lecture is work with your lab, communication, 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 whether it be with your lab, your mentor, uh, whoever else that you're working with, uh, uh, other groups of specialists. You need to ensure that communication and, and teamwork is what's going to sort of be the pearl that we're trying to get across here that's going to help get to a successful outcome for your patient. And last point is if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And we basically harped on this uh, right from uh, lecture two in terms of treatment planning. So let's go over a case here. In terms of the case, we basically have a 53-year-old healthy female who presents to her office for initial exam, and she's not been to the dentist in a long time uh, for her own specific reasons. And in this particular case, you can see this patient has a number of carious lesions. The patient was actually in pain with the bottom uh, bottom left molar there, and more or less, this patient needed to uh, go through um, a, 
a uh, bunch of basic basic uh, uh, dental uh, treatment prior to uh, basically considering some sort of an implant solution uh, for her. So the treatment plan for this patient was caries control uh, using the medical model of caries treatment, sanitive periodontal treatment, diet counseling, oral hygiene instruction, extraction of hopeless teeth, restoration of the restorable teeth, and follow up. And at, after a certain period of time, implant placement. Uh, restoration of the implant and, and a bite plane. So in this patient's particular case, we used a uh, this is an AstroTech uh, AstroTech um, uh, regular platform uh, 4.5 by 11 millimeter implant. Uh, I don't think AstroTech is AstroTech anymore. I b believe they're called uh, dense ply implants. But uh, you can see this picture. Basically, you can see the patient has the implant in at the crestal bone level. This is a bone level implant with a uh, healing abutment, uh, five millimeter healing abutment on the implant. Uh, here's a photograph of the healing abutment in place. Uh, in the next picture, you can see the healing abutment removed. And uh, AstroTech implants were one of the few, uh, sorry, the first ones that actually came out with the uh, internal platform switching and what they called the conical seal design or a conical fit. And we talked about the, uh, the benefits of this uh, in a previous lecture. In the next photograph, you can see that we have a impression coping. You can see the micro threads that sort of go along with this type of implant the, or the AstroTech implant. Uh, so here's the impression coping seated. Uh, here's a photograph now of the crown uh, that's basically been put into place. And so just like any other crown uh, in Crownerbridge or in Crownerbridge uh, dentistry, what we do is basically we'll seat our crown in. First thing you do is you check your contacts to make sure that your contacts are not too heavy. And in an implant dentist, you want to have very passive contact. You want to have a very passive fit because this is a screw retained crown. So uh, you basically can assess this using uh, two methods. One method is basically taking a piece of floss and assessing the passivity of the contact using a piece of floss and the second way to do this basically is to use something like a piece of shim stock and more or less if this is going to be a passive fit you should be able to move a piece of shim stock very easily uh, and the, the way to do this as we'll show you in the video is to basically put the piece of shim stock in put the screw retained crown in you can torque it in and then basically the shim stock should move out and in this particular patient's case, uh, so the first thing we check is the contacts, then you check the margins, and then you check the occlusion. So the way of checking the contacts we've already gone over, the way of checking the margin basically is to take a radiograph, and you want to see that this crown is, is seated uh, on the actual implant, that there's no black line or no space. So you can see from this case here, uh, you can see that the, the, the sort of the conical, uh, the conical connection of this uh, UCLA abutment to this implant is is fitting adequately. You can also see the platform switching that takes place with this sort of a design. And then lastly, you check your occlusion. And in terms of occlusion, uh, there's a number of things to check. The main thing to check for occlusion is to ensure that the occlusion is, is light uh, on the actual implant. And you want the patient to bite down nice and hard to compress those parad the periodontal ligament of the other teeth to ensure that just because it's light when they're biting lightly, uh, when they bite heavily, that you don't have all of a sudden this like heavy occlusion on the, on the implant because the implant's not going to necessarily like that. And more importantly, is to check the patient in lateral excursions to ensure that there's no non-working interferences. So we'll move towards a little video here quickly now. So in this video, you can see that we're basically uh, inserting the uh, screw retained crown. And in this case here, I have my assistant retracting uh, while I'm basically using a 1.25 millimeter hex wrench and basically placing uh, 
this with the piece of shim stock in place. You can now torque this into place. In this particular case, this is an AstroTech implant. Uh, we're using the torque wrenches provided with the AstroTech implants, and they recommend that you torque these down to 25 Newton centimeters. So the way this torque wrench works is you more or less twist it till it uh, sort of breaks at the appropriate torque level. You can see that right here. And once it's torqued into place, remove the uh, the actual uh, wrench components, and you can just take a cotton plier, a hemostat, and more or less what you want to see from a passive fit perspective is you want to see that this. Oh, so our first thing we're going to do is try to try the floss, and you can see the floss has a nice passive fit. And the second way of assessing this is to use that shim stock. So to, for demonstration purposes here, you can see that that shim stock moves through very easily, basically demonstrating the passive fit that exists there. Check the occlusion. So you can see here uh, Teflon or Teflon reel. Uh, we basically cut a piece of the Teflon off. And in the next photograph, you can see that we've adapted this Teflon into the orifice uh, of the screw retained crown. And what I'll generally do after etching uh, the screw retained crown and drying it off uh, is, sorry, washing the phosphoric acid out and drying it off, is put the uh, Teflon uh, plug in and use the uh, tip of a flowable composite, uh, uh, pa uh, a flowable composite syringe to pack this down and then taking some uh, flow, sorry, some uh, uh, some bonding resin, uh, applying that around the margins, and then taking some flowable composite on top. And in the next photograph, you can see what the final result sort of looks like. Once again, checking your occlusion in uh, centric occlusion and also in, uh, in excursions to ensure that there's no non-working interferences uh, for this particular case. So the next lecture, lecture nine, uh, part two, is the prosthetic phase. Uh, part two, and we went over the uh, the uh, sort of what we're going to be talking about in terms of impression techniques. Uh, as with all of our presentations, we've included the references uh, that have been used in the production of this entire uh, cr this entire online program. And finally, on behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for listening to our lecture.